Hello, BookTube. I'm here to uh, read an essay from one of the new books I received uh, today. It's called More Books on the Table. There always is. By Edmund Goss. Published by William Heinemann in 1923. And this appears to be a first printing. Uh, and... Yeah, it's. I was really surprised with it. Uh, I looked it up. I paid five pounds with shipping for it, and it's. I'm extremely happy with it. Uh, it's just got, as you can see, a little bit of a bump. Uh, well, it's more than a little bit, but it's got a bump to the top uh, corner there. But that's not too bad. Um, and it's a collection of essays um, from uh, from the Sunday Times. Uh, this is sort of the second collection he says he's done. I'm not sure the title of the first one. I'm going to have to uh, look that up. Um, but he says, uh, uh, he goes on to say in the preface, Perhaps I owe a word of apology to the authors and editors of the books which have started me on my brief excursions and independent reflections. These little essays are not, save in a few occasions, to be regarded as reviews, in quotes, of the books which inspired them. They do not pretend to give an adequate, though I hope always, uh, so far as it goes, an honest and candid account of the contents of each book. My object is not to teach, but, if I may be fortunate enough to do so, to pass on to others the pleasure which I have experienced. Now, the essay uh, that I want to read is the fifth one, two, three, no, sorry, seventh essay in. And it's called the Great A Great American Library. Now, um, Goss speaks of someone in here uh, that I will hopefully footnote sort of at the end because it's well, you, you'll see what I mean. It's it's somebody who who Revelations came after this was written and published that he might not be saying similar things uh, about. But anyway, let's let's get to the essay first of all. With careful consideration of the, of the danger of emphasis, I cannot claim less for the five sumptuous volumes of the catalogue of the late John Henry Wren than that they carry the art or science of modern bibliography further than it has ever been carried before. The Emperor Julian said that some there were who loved horses and others birds, others hunting wild beasts. But that, as for him, since he was a little child, he had indulged a wonderful longing to acquire and possess books. This possession shows no trace of expiring as the world grows old. More and more collectors expend their money and their cunning in flinching away rare volumes from other collectors. It is recognized an honorable sport and leaves more material behind, uh, behind it than golf or cricket. But, as the wish to gather together literary jewels grows on men, the desire increases to learn the exact value and to set down the accurate description of their treasures. The world is full of fakes and pitfalls, and so the literature of bibliography develops and becomes essential. It becomes full, fuller of detail and more rigorously technical. The most exact of living bibliographers is Mr. Thomas J. Wise whose modest and strenuous labors have gradually raised an entirely new standard of what a catalogue of books should be. When I say that the genius of Mr. Wise shines through each of the 1,500 pages of the Wren catalogue, I say enough to prove to every uh, lover of books the value of this compilation. The great library here catalogued is one which few Englishmen and not all Americans can hope to visit. It is a far cry to Austin, an inland, an inland town in the interior of the state of Texas, of which it is the jobbing center. This remote city on the borders of Mexico possesses a university open fewer than 40 years ago, but richly endowed and full of honorable ambition. I doubt if, Ms. if John Wren had ever heard of it, and I can imagine the look of mild surprise with which he would receive the news that his beloved books are lodged there. Wren was a papermaker of Chicago, born in 1841. 
He made a fortune by his typical American energy in business and then determined to enjoy himself rationally. Why he took up book collecting, I know not, but about 30 years ago, a very gentle, rather shy, sentimentally persistent American gentleman began to make an annual visit to London in search of first editions. He had the good fortune to secure Mr. Wise's acquaintance and the wisdom to avail himself of that expert, unparalleled experience. Wren's name was never in the newspapers, but every autumn when he went back to Chicago, the books were in his luggage. He often talked of a catalogue of his library, but always postponed it. At last, in 1911, he died suddenly a, a while he while he was paying a visit to California, visiting his collect, leaving his collection to his son and daughter, who were uh, filled with reverence for his memory, but lived at a distance from one another, and had no common convenience for keeping the books together. What was to be done? The vulture auctioneers and the shark booksellers were already rubbing their hands in glee at the idea of cutting up so rich a carcass. But Wren's family stood staunch. They reminded each other that their father had always wished that the books should not be dispersed. He had called his library, My Little Monument. And they decided that whatever their pecuniary loss, and mon that monument should never be shattered. There were important public reasons for this. Wren's library is, in certain ex respects, unique. In particular, it contains not merely a few dozen, but some hundreds of more or less obscure books of which not a single other copy is knowing to exist in the United States. Along certain lines of the less hackneyed departments of English literature, it is more rich than any other library. To break it up would have been to destroy a very important record. Meanwhile, Wren's son, under Mr. Wise's direction, began the huge task of cataloging, which took many years and involved several visits to England. Still no decision was come to as the destination of the books, but in 1918 the problem was solved by the public spirit of a, a leading inhabitant of Austin, Major George Littlefield. By this time, Wren's daughter was unhappily dead, but her husband, Mr. F. F. Norcross, continued the family traditions. The books were officially valued, and of the very high price named, Mr. Littlefield paid two-thirds, the Wren family waiving their claim to the other third, and the whole being then generously presented to the University of Texas, nor did the benefices benefic of Mr. Littlefield cease there. He built and gave to the University a magnificent building, which for all time attracted uh, students of English literature to the m modest city of Austin. In the annuals of Bibliophily, I know of no other prettier story. Moreover, observe a final touch of delicacy. The edifice, edifice is called the Wren Library, not the Littlefield Library. The importance of Wren's library does not rest on its containing all the popular conventional rarities. The first folio of Shakespeare is not there, nor any of the early quartos of the privately printed edition of George Herbert's Temple, nor Walton's Complete Angler of 1653, nor the Kilmarnock Burns. For these monsters, Wren had no consuming desire, but that he must set his heart upon is defined by Mr. Wise as, quote, books of real literary value for which the pages of any other catalogue will be searched in vain, end quote. He neglected English literature up to the close of the 16th century. It is in the 17th and 18th centuries that he was so astonishingly rich. In the 19th, his taste was a little more capricious, but he had a great affection for Shelley, Wordsworth, Tennyson, D.G. Rossetti, and Swinburne. His aim seems to have been generally cumulative. When he adopted an author, he tried his utmost to make his collection of that author complete, but he had some isolated treasures of almost fabulous importance. I propose to dwell on this broader, his broader principles, but I must mention those instances of extreme interest which have caught my eye as I turned over the pages. 
it would almost be worthwhile to traipse all the way to Texas to examine the celebrated copy of Chapman's All Fools, which that strange bandit John Payne Collier used to convey his forgery, and by which he took in all the learned world. Here is Shelley's Victor and Kazir of 1812, long believed to be unique uh, with an interesting history. And here is Deborah and Barak, 1705, the only copy yet discovered of the satirical poem of William Penn. The Commonwealth was a period uh, which simply uh, pol polluted, polluted, uh, with pamphlets in prose and verse. Most of these are anonymous, but many were signed by or can safely be attributed to famous or at least notorious names. Bibliography has neglected this class of literature to which Wren gave particular attention. James Barlow is ignored by the Dictionary of National Biography, but did not evade the notice of Wren, who collected a large number of the fantastic tracts which Barlow established during the Civil War. Barlow was a fervent royalist, and one of his poems bears the pleasant title of the Fairy Leveller, or King Charles. John Cleveland was by far the most popular of English poets during his, the lifetime of Milton, and his eccentric writing afforded the Red Catalog 14 interesting entries. But it is in that daring and uh, darling of the salesroom John Taylor the water poet that the Rand Library uh, particularly excels. For some reason which I do not fathom, the original issues of this vivacious but rather vulgar poet taster commanded prices at the present moment which are simply preposterous. During the Civil War the printing presses groaned under the effusions of the water poet, poet which bore such titles as a dialogue, or rather a parley between Prince Rupert's dog, whose name is Puddle, and Toby's dog, whose name is Pepper. Of these, Wren, uh, who had a positive passion for Taylor, contrived to ass uh, amass no fewer than 45, but I do not think he secured that which contains a woodcut, which is supposed to be a portrait of Shakespeare. However, uh, what he did collect would represent a little fortune in an open market. The remarkable department in the Wren Library deals with what Mr. Uh, Wilby has called the underworld of letters at the close of the 17th century. These insolent satirists and pamphleteers have hitherto defined the researches of the bibliographer, and their curious publications have neither been collected nor examined. Wren took a singular interest in them, and he possessed no fewer than 23 of the pamphlets of Tom Brown, whose publisher advertised him as, quote, not inferior in satirical prose or verse to Petronius, Marshall, or any other of the witty ancients, end quote. Of Ned Ward, uh, here are still more examples, 42 of the Hudebrasic squibs which he sent forth from his uh, genteel punch shop in Fullwood Grants. Uh, here are 30 of the per, uh, preposterous vivacious vivacities of Tom Durley, the burlesques of Charles Cotton, who wrote a mock Virgil, and of John Dennis, the old enemy of Pope, are not less amply representative, nor is Peter Mot Motu who wrote a poem on tea, translated by Molière, and died a disgusting death. Only I do not find Captain John Stevens, who translated so many Spanish uh, romances of low life. It, is, it was extreme, extremely intelligent of Wren to be the first to penetrate this Alsatia of letters, this queer crowded world of the coffee houses and the Grub Street, where never a book collector had ventured far before him. His reward was that it led him to Defoe and Swift and Mandeville. Here we outran all, uh, he, where he outran all competitors. His first editions of Swift are 121 in number. 
of Mandeville 29 and Defoe 119. Who in future will dare to edit Queen Anne worthy, uh, uh, Queen Anne worthy in, uh, without making a preliminary journey to Austin, Texas? It is the 18th century that the Wren Library preeminently shines. Never uh, was seen before such a galaxy of Addison and Pryor and Gay, of Fielding and Goldsmith and Smollett. I cannot imagine where Wren uh, contrived to pick up the less famous and therefore much rarer writers. Twelve separate first editions of Tickle, between uh, 26 of Savage, 51 of Garrick, it is enough to make the Bodleian fling itself into the arms of the British Museum and sink there in a swoon. The Popes, uh, too, are wonderful, and nearly 100 in number, prodigious, as Domini Sampson would say, but I observe that a gleam of malice that the rarest and best of the Dunceads, the B of Tom's list, is absent. When we come down to the 19th century, I find Mr. Wren's selection uh, to have been a little uncertain. He confined himself to the greatest names, and he was poor in De Quincey, in Lee Hunt, and particularly in Hazlitt. A few publications of Beddoes are very rare, but what was uh, a rarity to Wren? I am surprised to find Crabbe neglected. On the other hand, Byron, Shelley, and Keats are redundant in splendor. A copy of Endymion in the original drab boards with the white paper label intact and some lines of verse in the poet's handwriting is enough to render an envious bibliophile unwell. Let him calm himself. No other collector shall ever boast of this treasure. It dwells securely at Austin, Texas till the crack of doom. The manufacture of these five volumes is beyond praise. It was impossible to chronicle such a multitude of volumes without sacrificing something to brevity, and therefore the attributions are sometimes too summary. This could not be helped, but the student must be warned to take many of them with caution. The exactitude of the descriptions, on the other hand, is something quite extraordinary. Searching with a jealous care, I have spotted but a single misprint, Haywood's Gunnikian appears as Tunnikian. The books are printed on fine Waltman handmade paper and bound in primrose yellow buckram. At a moment of acute national self deprecation, we may cheer ourselves by noting that these beautiful volumes were made by a London, not an American firm, namely by Messrs. Heron and Company of Tottenham Court Road. Now, um, he praises uh, Thomas Wise uh, over and over again for um, his bibliography. Now, Wise, probably about a decade, 15 years after this, was unveiled as a mass forger of 19th century pamphlets and books. So, uh, some of the stuff that's in the Wren Library undoubtedly are going to be uh, some of his forgeries. Uh, which I find interesting, and apparently his forgeries are collectible in in of themselves now. And they have been for like 60, 70 years apparently, uh, once once it was known that they were forgeries. But uh, I do have a two-volume uh, bibliography he did of Swinburne. And it is it is a fabulous bibliography. I, I like the way he did it. Um, and I, I was wondering why I got it so cheap at the time. And then I realized later who he was. But it doesn't deter me from keeping it and wanting more of, of Wise's um, bibliographies because I, I will never be searching down uh, to, you know, or, or, or buying uh, first printings of the stuff that he talks about. I'll never be able to afford it. Um, and it's just, I do enjoy reading his descriptions in, in, in there. And it would be, it would be lovely to get his five volumes of the Rand Library, but I'm sure that's, that's going to be, uh, quite pricey. Uh, but anyway, and yeah, there's, uh, and I, I like the fact that, uh, that Wren, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, I'm trying to think of the words here. 
he uh, he specialized in uh, 18th century literature, 18th and 17th century. But I really do love the uh, one here, uh, the line where he he talks about that. He says, you know, after getting first editions of Tickle 26 of Savage and 51 of Garrick, it is enough to make the Bodleian fling itself in the arms of the British Museum and sink there in a swoon. I love that. Uh, but also, too, he talks about, you know, him having... Uh, Chapman's All Fools, which was uh, copied by John Payne Coyer, who who used it to convey a f forgery. Well, there you go. Uh, it sort of, you know, fits in with the forgeries of Thomas Wise. But anyway, um, no, this was enjoyable. I'll see if I can maybe pull a few others out of here. Um, but uh, I should be back a bit later, booktube, with a, a uh, tag, a book tag. Anyway, See you soon. Bye.